Mr. So, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, more gentlemen than ladies, but uh, overall, we have uh, 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 record participation of women leaders here at the World Economic Forum. So, I'm very happy about that. Um, we are here for a session, Middle Corridor from Pathway to Highway. Um, it's, uh, it's been a personal uh, interest of mine, uh, Central Asia, I have to say, and so I'm so glad that I think it's uh, more in prominence now uh, globally. Um, the, uh, not only uh, the economic, but also the political uh, developments uh, in, in Eurasia uh, overall. Um, I am here uh, uh, with a panel that could not be more august, I have to say, to discuss the future of the Eurasia region and particularly uh, the Middle Corridor. So let me just first introduce you because I want to make sure I do this properly. First, uh, I am joined here by Ilham Aliyev, President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. A warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, if you can uh, give them also applause, please. Prime Minister of Georgia, Irakli Garibashvili, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Johannes Hahn, Commissioner for Budget and Administration at the European Commission. Thank you. And Ebru Ozdemir, last but not least, uh, Chairperson of the Board Limang Holding from Turkey. So as you can see, we have uh, heads of state and government from the region. We also have a key partner, uh, uh, Europe, the EU, represented here. And uh, we are a platform for public-private cooperation. So, so I'm so glad to have Ebru here as well. And uh, from the private sector perspective, and also, of course, Turkey uh, plays a major role um, uh, in the middle corridor uh, as well. Um, before we go into the dialogue, let me just um, uh, say a few words about the context. First of all, obviously, in less than four weeks, uh, we will have the sad anniversary of the um, invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And uh, of course, there is the immense human suffering this has caused uh, in Ukraine. Um, um, it has also created or actually shattered existing certainty, certainties on partnerships, economic interdependencies, uh, and security. So Eurasia has been affected. Some of these certainties has been shattered, shifted, modified, if you will. Um, and I know from the conversations with many of you that you've been dealing with that actively. Uh, you've been on the front foot of many of those. But it has also led to this uh, reinvigoration of the concept and the implementation of the Middle Corridor. The Middle Corridor is not new. Those of you who follow Eurasia, Central Asia, the Caucasus closely, you know it's been there. But there has been, uh, now it's in a sharper focus, and there is a lot of uh, activity around that. Now, obviously, it's a, a commercial trade opportunity. Uh, but, of course, it's also about integration, so hopefully it's also about uh, shared prosperity and, and, and more peace and, and stability. It's also uh, about resilience uh, of supply chains, uh, diversification of supply chains for Europe uh, uh, in particular. Now, just to set it in further uh, perspective, uh, we, I think, all know that the northern corridor, so the if you look at the east-west uh, uh, trade route, the logistics route, the northern corridor um, uh, has been disrupted. So there is a, a much uh, less volume uh, of trade uh, in, that, in that northern uh, corridor. And the middle corridor then has seen an important uh, uh, revival. The volume of cargo traversing this route is expected to grow sixfold to 3.2 million metric tons in 2022 compared to 2021. Um, now, the middle corridor still represents about 8% per of the cargo volume shipped through the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, so just to set it in further perspective or framework, but we will uh, definitely see, uh, see a heavy increase. So really at the heart of the discussion today is obviously the trade discussion, the logistics discussion, uh, and, and so the practical one as well. But I think there is the larger than more geostrategic 
discussion here as well. And so that's why I'm so glad to have all of you with me to help us uh, get some further understanding uh, of those elements. Um, we will have um, about 40 minutes with each other, and so this should be uh, a dialogue. Uh, first, I would like to go to uh, President Aliyev and Prime Minister Garibashvili. We've seen a series of multi-party agreements um, uh, around uh, the Middle Corridor recently. So what can we expect at the intergovernmental level uh, along this axis uh, in the coming year or even uh, beyond that? Uh, let me start with you, Mr. President, and then with, uh, I will go to you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. I think uh, one of the advantages of the Middle Corridor is that the countries which are involved in this huge project have uh, good relations between themselves. I think this is one of the main prerequisites for success in any multinational uh, initiative. Azerbaijan has uh, excellent relations with its uh, neighbors to the west, Georgia and Turkey, and to the east, Central Asia. And being a kind of a natural geographical bridge between east and west, we invested largely into transportation infrastructure in the previous years. Mm -hmm. And actually, all the necessary infrastructure facilities in Azerbaijan are ready to receive more cargoes. Our seaport, which has a capacity of 15 million tons, will be expanded, and already the budget allocated for that, up to 25 million tons, because we expect a growing number of cargoes for particular reasons which you mentioned, the difficulties uh, of uh, transportation through traditional northern route. We already have uh, seen the diversion of a large number of cargoes from Central Asia, and this is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, I'd like to add that starting from this year, we started to uh, transit uh, oil from Kazakhstan, and not only from Turkmenistan, which already uh, takes place for many years, uh, with the potential to use this corridor also for hydrocarbons. Uh, therefore, I think that we uh, now need to have more closer cooperation between all the countries involved, Central Asia, and the Caucasus and Europe uh, in order to work actively on customs administration, mm -hmm. to have uh, more or less a single, uh, single window approach, and on tariff policy, because we need to make this route not only attractive from point of view of absence of other routes, but attractive from a commercial point of view. And by the way, when we started our meeting, I noticed that we sit the same way how our pipeline goes. <laughs> 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 but I'm from Czech Republic. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> pipeline starts in Azerbaijan. <laughs> <laughs> Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, Europe. But we are working on a reverse flow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, the macro picture from you, Mr. Prime Minister. First of all, thank you very much for organizing this panel. I think this is very important. And uh, you mentioned the war in Ukraine. Of course, the war in Ukraine is uh, catastrophic for the entire region. Of course, it affects us as well. And uh, I think this war showed us that uh, countries and nations need to diversify their economies. Uh, I think before the war, less countries paid less attention to the middle corridor. But after the war, the attention has, is growing and is increasing. So therefore, as Mr. President Ali have mentioned, I also want to repeat that we have excellent relationship with Azerbaijan, with Kazakhstan, with Turkey. We have strategic partnership. And I think the chemistry is here, and this is the strong foundation to work together. What I also want to mention about Georgia, we are, uh, right now we are investing heavily in infrastructure. Mm. First of all, I want to mention that uh, highway, we are building highways, which will be uh, completed by the end of 2024. We're spending like two or three billion dollars to complete this highway. And of course, this will uh, facilitate uh, this transportation. Second, I also, I, I also want to mention the ports, the ports capacity of uh, Black Sea of Georgia is, uh, is quite big, but I think we need to, we need to increase it. Therefore, I want to 
mention about one particular project, which is Anaklia Deep Seaport. We, are, we have decided that the government of Georgia will start construction of this port. 51% of uh, this port will be this consortium that we want to build will be owned by Georgia, by the government of Georgia. And of course, for the rest, 49%, we want to announce an international tender. And we are talking with many uh, potential investors for this. So now, why we are, we are doing this? Why we, are, why we want to build this port? Uh, President Ali have mentioned about the increase of capacity of Azerbaijani ports. I think Kazakhstan has the same intention. So Georgia has now uh, capacity about around 550,000 uh, TU in uh, Porti port, around 200,000 in Batumi port, but this, this is not enough. So that's why we want to uh, implement this project. And third, I also want to mention that um, uh, we are together with Azerbaijan, we are developing uh, different initiatives. For example, I want to mention Black Sea uh, submarine uh, cable, electric cable, which is also very interesting. Uh, this we are doing with, together with Azerbaijan, with Romania, with Hungary, and this initiative is backed by the European Union. And in fact, we were in Bucharest in December, where we signed a memorandum. All four countries will implement, will invest into this uh, ambitious, I would say, ambitious project. Mm -hmm. But this is very interesting. And uh, therefore, uh, we must be ready for the increased uh, flow of goods. I also want to mention that this corridor and this route is the shortest route to connect Asia with Europe. For example, uh, train from China can come to Georgia within 15 days, maximum 20 days. So we compare it to, uh, to uh, uh, like a, uh, by sea, it takes 45 days, right, the ship. So therefore, this is a very interesting, very important corridor. And of course, all these countries are definitely motivated, determined to uh, develop this corridor. Two months ago, we were in Kazakhstan, uh, where we signed, uh, we, we agreed on the roadmap how to develop this, this corridor and how to kind of uh, uh, lift and remove all the artificially created barriers, if such. So therefore, we are moving in this, in the, in this direction. And I'm very optimistic that uh, we will have a bigger potential and all these countries will benefit from, all this, from, this, from this corridor. Thank you so much. I'm just curious, would you mind, um, between Az uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia, uh, if there is any kind of cargo, how does it, how does it go? How, uh, how, do, how is the trans-border transportation? So, so first we can all, imagine yes. what it looks like now. First of all, the highways, which I mentioned, and railway. Right now, the, the capacity of railway of Georgia is 25 million tons. Right now, we are implementing the um, modernization of railway. This will be completed by 2024, by the end of 24 and the capacity will be about 48 million tons. Mm -hmm. Besides that, uh, together with Azerbaijan, we are now building a bakut Pilisi cars railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, several months ago, Azerbaijan provided additional funds to complete this project. Mm -hmm. So this project will also be ready by 2024. Mm -hmm. This is another 5 million tons oh, of well, cargo. Nice. So this is, these are very strategic, the important projects. I also want to mention uh, the relationship between Azerbaijan and Georgia. Uh, this relationship is tested, reliable, trusted. We have implemented together uh, very important historical uh, projects, such as the oil and gas uh, pipelines. So now this uh, railway project and many others, which will come in the future. Thank you so much. Now going to the private sector, Eber, if I could go to you. Um, I know the middle corridor relies heavily, of course, on public-private cooperation and private sector players are using it and will be using it. So what, what is your perspective on that as a, as a very diversified um, holding? Uh, what, would be, what would be your also advice to the governments that are in the intergovernmental process now making all these changes to the regulation, building on that infrastructure? What would be your advice or even your suggestion Just, in terms of some of the things that, uh, that uh, would be particularly uh, useful to private sector players? to start using it more. Okay, thank, thanks for the opportunity. And Mirek, I just want to take 30 seconds of what you have started about the women leaders. 
I mean, World Economic Forum is investing a lot on this, and I'm working on global parity. And today we were awarded the Lighthouse Award with Turkish women engineers. And actually we are taking it to global, global women engineers. And for this important infrastructure project, we'll definitely need a lot of engineers, whom I hope 50% will be women to work. And by the way, we have already a partnership with Sokar in Turkey for chemical engineers. So it's, it's good to see all these leaders and we really want to support for the inclusion and for the equ equality. It's not actually equality, it's women empowerment because it's human capital. We need all the human capital to realize these ambitious projects. So in a nutshell, what does real, uh, I mean, private sector looks, it has to be feasible. So this corridor is faster, it's shorter, it's more climate uh, friendly. And one, uh, more than that, I mean, as Mr. President and the Prime Minister said, there's a big cooperation, friendship among the countries so that we can work together. I mean, if there is this high level of cooperation, it's easier for the uh, private sector to work. So I think the fundamentals are there. And Tur Turkey has invested a lot on infrastructure for the past years. I mean, I'm, we've done even ourselves, we, re, we, we, we have a port in the East Med, we got the oldest port, Iskenderun port, we made the newest port. The highways in Turkey is unbelievably uh, modern. Now, of course, we are investing in rail. So, railroads, I think, is the least developed yet. We have, uh, in Turkey, we have done the Kars Tbilisi, Jehan, uh, Kars Tbilisi project in 2017. Now we are investing a lot on railroads, especially signalization, because they, uh, from the uh, sustainability perspective, we need railroads. It's going to be faster and cheaper, definitely. I mean, the element needed in this corridor is the railroads. Mm. As Mr. Uh, President and Prime Minister said, I mean, we are, the ports are already been invested. Now in Turkey, the high road, highways are ready. We just built Çanakkale Bridge as one of the gateways to Europe, which uh, connects Anatolia to Europe. And this is the longest span bridge in the world. And as private sector and as a PPP, I chaired this project as a chairperson uh, for in four, four and a half years. But we built the longest span bridge in the world in four and a half years in Turkey on a PPP basis. And the investment amount was not law, it was $3 billion. So what I mean is the infrastructure can be really built in a faster and a very um, effective way in a very short time. So we should not be afraid like, okay, you know, this corridor will not be built or so. I mean, with the government support and with the uh, private sector deliverables and the speed and effectiveness, I think this will be realized. My proposition is, of course, at one point, this whole corridor will be operated. And there should be a governing or an operational body, maybe like a company or so, which should be definitely private sector influence as well. Mm -hmm. And the other important thing would be, of course, the tax and the customs. Still, I feel like, I mean, working in 14 different countries, I feel like the customs is the like, least developed in the world. So the, this system definitely should be uh, uh, should become more viable, more faster. And the other thing probably would be the currency. I mean, being in World Economic Forum, everything is, we are like, you know, new, modern. Maybe a blockchain could be one way to uh, manage this. And we should definitely not be afraid of uh, new and modern ideas. But I think this collaboration, Mr. President, our country's president and prime minister will be able to manage this corridor as fast as possible. And I think we need this alternative route in today's globally complex environment. Thank you so much. I think this um, structure of how it will be all operated is quite an interesting one. I would love to then come back to the president and the prime minister if they have any ideas already, uh, but... And Mira, can I add one more thing? I just, please, because please. From the private sector point, I, I, I forgot something. Be everyone says that, I mean, as Mr. President said, it's like a transit, but it's actually not going to be a transit thing. I mean, it's more the countries that is on the route will benefit from that. As we see, our side of the world, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, is growing enormously, and we are doing a lot on this side of the world. So this means, from the private sector point, this corridor means um, logistic centers, depots, storage units, a lot of private sector involvement. Mm. So by this way, actually, all the businesses will benefit as well. So to see this corridor just as a transit, I think, will be misleading.
I uh, fully agree. I actually also wanted to ask about how we can use that as a market. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, um, so before I r return to the heads of state and government we have here, if I could go to you, uh, Commissioner Han. Um, Eurasia and the Middle Corridor ha has emerged um, as a clear strategic um, priority for the, for the EU. So just for us to map the involvement of the EU right now in this uh, new development of the Middle Corridor, could you describe to us what is the involvement, what are the instruments of the EU vis-à-vis -vis this project specifically and in Eurasia in general, if you can? Well, first, uh, I, um, I'm grateful for your very last comments because my first point would have been that we are speaking about the corridor and not about the tunnel, which means a corridor has uh, rooms left and right. Yes. And this is why I fully agree that um, the so-called corridor has a huge impact on the economic development in the region itself. Yes. And, uh, and I fully agree this is uh, a, at least equally imminent uh, to, to the entire, let's say, strategy. Because from a European perspective, it's uh, not only about uh, uh, guaranteeing uh, the supply chain and, uh, and, and, and everything, but also for having uh, peace and stability mm -hmm. in our neighborhood. And uh, of course, the South Caucasus is, is a region. Uh, I mean, there are two countries, but uh, the region consists at least of three. And uh, I think this is also something we should not forget. Mm -hmm. But important for us is, again, to create peace, stability, economic development, and therefore, mm -hmm. any kind of uh, engagement, any kind of uh, economic development is contributing to more stability. And uh, as in such an initiative, there are many uh, participants and uh, beneficiaries, starting from China, if you like, ending in, in Europe. I think the more are involved, the more uh, it also contributes to stability, to uh, what we see, uh, 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 what we call multilateralism. Multilateralism is nothing else that uh, the global order should be based on rules, on agreements and contracts which are mutually respected. So this is, from a strategic political point, something very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to, to stress this because uh, very often this corridor debate is reduced to the uh, 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 supply chain and the delivery of oil and gas and that's it. But there is a wider dimension, and I think this is something we should not forget, and this is something which uh, leads us. That's why we have developed not only for this part of the world, for this initiative, this gateway project, where we consider, so to say, the engagement with uh, partners around the globe, where we believe it's important to have a closer cooperation with us. Having said all this, um, we have a set of uh, a toolbox of possibilities uh, concerning the financing. Uh, I think this is, in principle, well known. We have our investment banks, we have the EBRD, etc. We, we offer also guarantee schemes, uh, so there are a lot of possibilities. The issue from our perspective is a little bit that we have different, let's say, contractual agreements with the countries in the region, because it's finally the choice of our partner countries which kind of um, a contractual arrangement they are looking for. So, for instance, with Georgia, we have this deep and uh, comprehensive free trade agreement. Azerbaijan has uh, chosen uh, not to have such an intensive kind of cooperation. Uh, of course, this is something we have to respect, but in terms of talking about um, uh, um, custom fees, etc., it started to make a difference, yeah? or could start to make a difference. Uh, but this is something which is there. We have to see how things evolve. Uh, we are talking so much about regional economic zones or areas. Why not also in this region as a future perspective? Uh, once again, bottom line, Europe is very interested mm -hmm. uh, in this kind of development, even uh, more uh, due to the war, but already before the war, as uh, for the reasons I have mentioned, and uh, that's why we are very much committed and, and ready to engage, even probably more than it was in the past. Mm. Can I just have a follow-up question, Commissioner? Um, 
because it was such a disruption and let's face it, this axis is now even more strategic than before and Europe uh, has uh, reacted to that disruption of Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, with uh, new tools or a bolstered tool. So to your knowledge, has there been an uh, increase in using the tools in Eurasia, uh, the, the, the EBRDs, the EIBs, etc., cetera, or, or is it more a continuation of what was there before? Is it more long-term? Uh, I mean, it's not, um, I would say, a boom, uh, but you can really see an increase of uh, using the possibilities. And I have to say that, for instance, my, my colleague, Josep Parel, the, the high representative, is paying a lot of attention to the region, is visiting uh, very often the region, participating, organizing uh, events, clearly an expression of our specific focus on this region, once again, also for our own interest, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, security and economic interests. Thank you. If I could go back to you, uh, Mr. President, and then also to you, Mr. Prime Minister, on the governance of the project, if you can share if there are some ideas uh, in the future how it will look like, and then also on the market. So what are your thoughts about how this is, of course, not only a tunnel, but it's actually an ecosystem maybe that is benefiting and maybe creating a new regional market? Yes, I fully agree with uh, the comment of Madame Ebru because uh, really she was very right to say it's not a just a corridor, and as Commissioner said, it's not a tunnel. And we have big expectations. Of course, uh, becoming a transit country in the sense of uh, today's reality is important, but for us the most important uh, thing is jobs and uh, local production. Mm -hmm. For that purpose, we are working very hard on diversification of our economy, and we think that the transportation not only will be helping us to diversify our exports, so we will export the services, but at the same time being on route on the middle corridor, at the same time being on route of the corridor north-south, uh, creates additional opportunities for uh, business uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, soon there'll be uh, inauguration of the free zone in uh, Baku, which is just next door to the seaport. And uh, we hope that this free zone will uh, be a place of manufacturing and a place where uh, companies will uh, find itself uh, appropriate to invest. Uh, improvement of business climate, of course, is one of the main factors of success because all the countries in the world, even the most developed, they need additional investments. And here, uh, only business climate, of course, is not enough. Uh, we are coming back to from what we started and what uh, Prime Minister Garibashvili said about the relationship between countries. This is a really, I think, the unique situation, uh, one of the, I think, most friendly environments uh, on global scale, relationship between Azerbaijan and Georgia, Azerbaijan and Turkey, Georgia and Turkey, and trilateral. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we have uh, several formats of trilateral cooperation, ministers of foreign affairs, defense, economy. There also was a leader summit. Uh, and we started uh, sharing the profit. We started clearly understanding that there should be a balance. We started with energy projects, definitely, between producers, transitors, and consumers. And we managed to create this win-win situation and, uh, how to say, balance of interest was preserved. So actually, the railroad connections which we built relatively recently and which we will expand now from Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and down to Europe was uh, inspired by our successful implementation of oil and gas pipeline projects. So on this side, of the corridor, I think everything is settled. Now what we need, we need to uh, create, and I again want to agree with Madame Bru that there should be a kind of a steering committee, a kind of a management board of all countries involved, Central Asia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, European partners, including all the um, transportation infrastructure, for instance, we have the biggest uh, trade fleet in the Caspian with 53 vessels, seaport, 
Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, railroad connections between Central Asian countries. Also, you know, they're not uh, well connected between themselves. And there are new projects, for instance, project which uh, China is uh, now initiated the China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan uh, railroad project, which eventually will come to the Caspian and then further down in, in our direction. But also important is to work not only on transportation um, and advantages of east-west, but also west-east. So far, the most attention is how to bring cargoes from China, Central Asia, through Caspian to Europe. Mm -hmm. But we need also to think how to have the cargoes in opposite direction. And for that, of course, the business climate in opposite direction should also be uh, in line with uh, our targets. Thank you so much. Same question to the Prime Minister. Thank you. Um, Georgia has one of the best investment climates. Right now, we're number seven in the world in terms of doing business, is or doing business. Uh, besides that, uh, we're among top 10, 20 uh, rankings when it comes to economic freedom or uh, many, many rankings. So, mm -hmm. so therefore, there's a big uh, potential to invest uh, and do business in Georgia. I also want to mention that we also have uh, four uh, free industrial zones. And as President Aliyev mentioned, this is a great opportunity uh, for the foreign companies to uh, bring the factories, industries, uh, and invest in Azerbaijan and Georgia in this corridor. Plus, I also want to mention that we want to link this uh, opportunity to the renewables, because Georgia has, is rich of uh, hydro resources. Right now, we use only 27% of uh, hydro. Uh, we have uh, uh, developed a strategy. We want to uh, invest a lot in renewables in hydro, uh, solar, wind. So therefore, the investors and the businesses will be able to use this uh, cheap energy and also the location, which is uh, very strategic and very important. And the ports, and of course, uh, this will all together in, in uh, this will facilitate doing business uh, for, for the investors. Uh, I also want to mention uh, in terms of governance, governance of this, uh, of this uh, matter, as uh, President Aliyev mentioned, I think this is a great initiative. We also had a working, let's say, meeting in Kazakhstan mm. at the ministerial level, and where we signed the roadmap, so-called roadmap, how to develop, how to facilitate, right? How to lift the uh, barriers. And I think we will agree on further steps and move forward. The plan is that we want to, uh, the initial roadmap that we already agreed on is 2022, 2027. So in this time frame, we should uh, prepare the corridor. Thank you so much. Um, Emiru, if I, I know you're not in the, in the government, but uh, <laughs> just, uh, just since you are from Turkey and Turkey plays such, a, such an important role. So if you, if you could, if you know, what, is the, uh, what would be the footprint of Turkey right now along, along the corridor? And do you see some areas where Turkish company, your company, or other specific sectors where you want to go, um, um, not along only the corridor, but in the market of Eurasia? Where, you do, where do you see the possibilities? Uh, so, as I said, we are a construction infrastructure company. I mean, there's going to be definitely a lot of infrastructure needs here. The rehabilitation of the railroad. Railroad is definitely a must. The ports, the highways, and so forth. So these could be definitely built by companies from Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey. But on the operation side, when this is built, then you will see that private sector looks for opportunities. And if the feasibility is there, private sector invest. We build a new airport in Istanbul. We build the Sabiha Gökçen Airport. As soon as the airport is built, suddenly we saw you know, the transfer centers around, logistic centers, free trade zones. So basically, when you reach or when you have the infrastructure, the private sector comes in. Mm. And I think that now Tur Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia, our region will be an alternative supply for Europe. I mean, this exports and this trade, we believe, is definitely going to increase. Turkey, Turkey is now 90 million. I mean, it's a big market. 
and the same as Georgia and Azerbaijan, developing our GTB is increasing. So this ecosystem will have its needs as well. As I said, it's not only a transit, but it, it will create its own uh, private sector and its own needs, and we'll definitely see a big development there. And I'm not from the government, but I can say that Turkey definitely believes in this, as the, Mr. President said, win-win situation. And now one of the themes of the World Economic Forum is collaboration. Mm. I mean, I think this good friendship and this good relationship in this side of the world could create a very good example in this turmoil that the world is in. And if we could be able to uh, definitely I mean, build this infrastructure with the help of the private sector on time and as fast as possible, as we have already done, done in the energy, I mean, TANAP is one of the gas pipelines. We mm. were involved as well. It was built in a record time, like you typically see Jayan oil pipeline. I mean, it was built in the most efficient way, and it's ongoing, it's working very well. So the same thing can be built in this, and applied in this corridor as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, if I could just, because I think one of you mentioned that it would be good to also figure out then how do we, uh, how do, we de, uh, do the um, reciprocal uh, west to east. Any thoughts on that uh, on, on your side, or is it more of a technical issue that... Uh... No, not at all. I mean, um, I think uh, what we have learned very recently, painfully, and uh, I think uh, we have, uh, uh, thanks God, given up uh, our naivety in terms that uh, certain s suppliers are always there with a, a low price or certain um, uh, raw materials will always come, or ingredients for pharmaceutical issues, etc. So I think we have now started to understand we have to rethink, and um, the code word is diversification. Mm -hmm. And diversification means not only diversification of supply chains, but also of uh, 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 so say selling our products to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Europe is by far the most international continent uh, in the world. So we are the biggest importer and the biggest exporter. Mm -hmm. And this is why uh, I think we should have and we have every interest to further strengthen our ties by um, establishing further trade agreements also with partners, for instance, in the southeast uh, of, of, of the world. Uh, we are talking uh, 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 with some Asia, uh, ASEAN countries um, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. And for all this, trade agreement means to import and to export. Mm -hmm. And therefore, by definition, we are much, very much interested. This is not a one-way street, but it's uh, going into both directions. Thank you. Since I have you here, uh, Mr. President, I need to, of course, ask you about energy as well. Um, specifically, this is webcast, so there's also this value of really updating the general public on where we are. Uh, where, what would be your, what is the state of play in terms of, I know you've boosted uh, the delivery uh, of energy to Europe. I mean, it's short to, uh, of a miracle, frankly. Uh, but if you could kind of update us on your thinking for this coming year and strategically maybe for the next decade, both on, on gas, but also if you could tell us in, around the plans of Azerbaijan, which I know you have, also around green energy. With respect to natural gas, as soon as we got the request from European Commission, we started immediately to work on different uh, directions. First, physical increase of production, and then efficiency, reduction of losses and looking where else we can save gas, which we use for domestic purposes, and to channel it uh, to the European market. Uh, 2021, our export to EU market was something more than 8 billion cubic meters. This year, it will be at least 11.6, and so the growth is very rapid. Of total, 24. Mm. Uh, um, MOU, which was signed between European Commission and Azerbaijan this summer, presumes that by 2027 we will double the supply. So the supply to European Union will be minimum at a level of 20 billion cubic meters. For that, there should be more interconnectors in Europe, and one of them in the end of the last year was inaugurated Greece-Bulgaria. 
this allowed us to start to supply to Bulgaria and starting from this year to Romania mm -hmm. and to Moldova. At the same time, we need to expand brand new facility, which Limac also contributed to, TANAP from 16 to 32 BCM mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and TAP from 10 to 20 BCM. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine TAP was inaugurated only two years ago. And we thought that this is a volume which Europe will need for long term, but now we need to expand. So it will be additional financing. Mm. And we are ready to do it. So uh, we are really working very hard in order to satisfy the growing needs of European consumers. On green energy, the potential is huge. Uh, Caspian Sea uh, wind potential is 157 gigawatts. Uh, onshore potential is 27. And also 10 uh, gigawatt potential is in the territories which we liberated uh, two years ago during the liberation war, so almost 200. As Prime Minister mentioned, uh, last December we signed an agreement in Bucharest to build a subsea cable from Georgia to Romania, <clears throat> and the capacity of this cable will be 4 gigawatt. Mm. Now the feasibility study is underway. As soon as it is ready, we will think about composition of financing, and of course we'll need the support of uh, European financial institutions. Uh, Agreement signed with Mazdar will, um, by 2027, add 4 gigawatt production of wind and uh, solar, and uh, 6 to come until 2037. And MOU with Fortescue Future Industries provide investments up to 12 gigawatt in Azerbaijan. So really, it's a, um, it's a new chapter of our energy policy. Oil is done, gas is done, electricity, green hydrogen, and all that is in our plans. Thank you. Uh, one more thing to you, Mr. President. We have about three minutes left, but I, of course, it's top of mind. And I think, uh, Commissioner, you mentioned it. Um, a lot of people think that if there is economic integration, then there, there's also more stability and peace. So if you could tell us um, on your relationship with Armenia, uh, what can we expect on the, how can we have lasting peace from your, from your perspective? Where are we Two minutes that? will not be enough <laughs> <laughs> to <laughs> tell the story. But uh, where uh, are we now? We are uh, in the middle of nowhere because, <laughs> because unfortunately Armenia did not respond to our proposal to sign peace deal, which will be very simple and which will be based on the fundamental principles of international law. Commissioner Hahn uh, hinted to the absence of Armenia here. He said there are two South Caucasian countries, but they're at least three. I know whom he meant. But why Armenia is not here? Because our proposal with Georgia to start trilateral format of cooperation was rejected by Armenia. I highly value the efforts of my friend Irak Garibashvili, who hosted a meeting of foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia, and Georgian colleague joined. So our suggestion was for leaders to meet in Georgia, because Georgia always historically was a place where all the neighbors met, but Armenia is not ready for that. And this is one of the potential risks, because if three Caucasian countries unite their efforts in energy, transportation, security, stability, border delimitation, the region will be much safer. Thank you so much. So I'd like to close the session with Mr. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister um, also on this. So if you could, uh, if you could uh, give me your perspective on how we can get to long-lasting peace in South Caucasus. Sure. But also, if you could, uh, because I know there, you've been, of course, on uh, uh, the ambition regarding NATO and the EU, so kind of the geopolitical outlook so for your country. Well, first of all, regarding the relationship uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, Georgia is truly a neutral, unbiased, objective mediator. What President Aliyev mentioned this is truly our interest to organize such a meeting, trilateral meeting, because this region belongs to us. It belongs to Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, 
And we really, we can transform this region into a region of opportunities, mm -hmm. peace, stability, and prosperity. And I also want to mention one thing. During the Soviet time and Cold War, there was a famous saying, trust but, but verify. In Davos, I heard an interesting formula. Mm -hmm. Distrust, but cooperate. <laughs> I believe in cooperation. I haven't heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Distrust, but cooperate. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a, a wide-ranging panel. <laughs> But just to leave you with the thought that I really wish you the best of luck in, in, in uh, further building the middle corridor. And I really hope that, again, to the point of Commissioner Han, that once it's done, it's really not only a corridor, but it's really a market, an ecosystem, which can drive prosperity and peace for all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.